This is WDS 2010, so I'm Julie from the Archdiocese of Edmonton. I am delighted that Monsignor John Rodano is here uh, at the at the WDS conference. Uh, for seven years, when I worked at the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity between 2001 and 2008, he was my immediate superior. He was in charge of uh, uh, the head of the sector for all of the dialogues with Western Christian churches and ecclesial communities, and I worked with the Anglican Communion and World Methodist Council. Uh, I went to Monsignor Rodano's office daily asking for his advice, his input, his suggestions, his guidance. I don't think that there is anyone on the planet who knows better what the Catholic Church has done in terms of ecumenical dialogue and ecumenical relations since the Second Vatican Council. Uh, in the past, uh, well, in the 24 years that he worked at the Pontifical Council, he was the editor of Information Service, which was the, uh, the documentary documentation service uh, put out by the Pontifical Council. So he read every letter, every document that officially came out of Rome, and seems to have an encyclopedic knowledge of that uh, of that historical account of of our involvement in the ecumenical movement. He was also uh, the Vatican staff person for dialogue with the Reformed churches, uh, with uh, Anabaptists. Uh, he chaired the dialogue with the uh, Evangelicals for a period of time, and he worked with the uh, Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches. He's immensely well respected by leading ecumenists uh, of uh, other Christian churches. Uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous warmth and respect for his contribution, and happily that contribution continues now, uh, even after he's left the Pontifical Council. In terms of uh, uh, giving an account of the Catholic Church's engagement in ecumenical questions, so uh, I think that we're we're very privileged to to have him speaking here with us. Do you uh, can you speak to uh, what your enthusiastic about in your diocese or that's happening ecumenically? Or? Certainly. <coughs> well, the Diocese of Saskatoon has uh, been richly blessed uh, in terms of ecumenical relations. Uh, at the time of the Second Vatican Council when Pope John spoke of, uh, identified the search for Christian unity as one of the goals of the Council, uh, Father Bernard de Marjorie, a newly ordained priest of the Diocese of Saskatoon, was captured by, by that vision. And uh, he went on to found the Prairie Center for Ecumenism, uh, which still runs today in Saskatoon. And uh, there's a long history of cooperation between uh, Christian churches and Christian leaders in, in Saskatoon. They found it a very warm place to come to as a new bishop. And uh, there's, a, there's a willingness to uh, to work together wherever possible. And I think there's, there's a, really a sense that we do hold much in common and that based on what we hold in common, we should find ways to engage in common prayer and common witness and common study. Uh, alongside that, there's a, there's a warmth and a friendship which uh, is already in place. And uh, so it was incredibly welcoming. Uh, they were They were very welcoming to me as the new new Roman Catholic Bishop of, uh, of Saskatoon. In terms of particular projects, uh, <coughs> I would highlight, uh, highlight one, that uh, in the core neighborhoods of Saskatoon there is no major food store. And there's been an effort from local community groups to try to build and set up a, a cooperative uh, food store, which would also give advice and guidance on on food and cooking, and uh, they need to raise quite a bit of uh, money in order to get this uh, set up. It's called the Good Food Junction, and uh, the Christian churches are are working together in terms of uh, supporting this project. It's not a not a church project. It's directed towards really human need and the common good, uh, but there's a 
a willingness and even an eagerness to, uh, to share in our, our support of that project. So for me, that's indicative of uh, uh, a sense that whenever we can act together, wherever it's appropriate and responsible for us as Christian churches and leaders to act or speak together, there seems to be a, a readiness and willingness to do so. Well, certainly the Ukrainian Catholic Church in Western Canada is affected in the broad scale in the topic of ecumenism because we live in a society throughout all of Canada and especially Western Canada where there are many faiths. The, the work of uh, ecumenism that you are all involved directly with is so important to the church and so important to Christ. Um, the, um, we all know the, the quotation from John's Gospel where in the prayer of Jesus uh, at the end of his life when he prayed that all those who have come to know his word through the church would be one. And, uh, and so since it's important to Christ, it's important to us. And, uh, and I know well aware of the challenges of ecumenical work today. It's, uh, it's hard work to, uh, we've gone beyond the original, the initial sort of excitement of actually talking to each other in the, within the Christian churches and maybe even going into each other's churches because when I was a young fellow, it, uh, it was a mortal sin to go into a Protestant church, you know, um, and, and unless it was a very close friend at a funeral, but uh, you would never take part in, an, in another, uh, Christian faith's liturgy or prayers, and that wasn't good. Uh, you know, it, uh, it was the time, but when we first began, I remember I was a young priest, when we first began to, to be invited to different churches to give talks or to, or to pray together and to socialize together, and it was exciting. And there were hundreds of people who would go out to do that, you know, many hundreds of times were uh, the week of prayer for Christian unity. But then over the three or four decades that have in, ensued since that time, we know we don't get those hundreds anymore. We get a few dedicated people. So it, it's taking on a new dimension now, but an important dimension. And I believe that it will, it will succeed because it addresses a deep need within every human being's heart, this desire to be one with others. It's, it's a need that gets beat up in many ways by all sorts of other things in our society and in our human lives. But, um, you know, we are made in the image of God and uh, in that quotation from John where Jesus prays that we would all be one, he prays that we would be one as the Father is in Jesus and as Jesus is in the Father. And in other words, our unity is not a, a theological one primarily, it's not an intellectual one primarily, it's a unity of relationship, the oneness that's brought about in a desire to be one and to relate to one another in that unity. And it has its root in, in the Trinity, it's the Father and the Son. The relationship in the Trinity is essentially relationship. I remember when the, um, I believe, I always get in trouble when I quote papal documents and I always stand up and say, you know, uh, I don't mind doing it because there's always experts in the crowd, you know, so uh, I did that during the bishops' conference, for the bishops' plenary meetings last week and half the bishops are seminary rectors and theologians and I was a parish priest for 37 years, so um, you don't use big long, many big long words or things like that in parish ministry. But I remember reading, which I believe was the uh, Pastores da Bovobis of, John the, of uh, Pope John Paul II. And in that, uh, he described the Trinity, used the word epichoresis, which I had never heard before. And in the copy of the encyclical that I had, there was no translation or comment on it. You know. So there were, I was an auxiliary bishop in Toronto at the time, and the other two 
uh, auxiliaries with me were, one was the former rector of St. Peter's, of St. Augustine Seminary, uh, Bishop John Boisano, and Bishop uh, Richard Greco, who taught at the seminary. And of course, the Archbishop was Cardinal Ambrosic, who was a, a well-known scripture scholar on Mark's gospel. So I didn't go to him with my ignorance, <laughs> but I did go to Bishop Boisano, and he didn't know what it meant. And I went to Bishop Greco, and he didn't know what it meant. And finally, I think I Googled it, which is the source of all information. <laughs> and found out that the root word of epichoresis is uh, the word that we use for choreography. It's a dance. And it's been a long time since I studied Greek, but I think the Greek prefix epi means either to or into. Am I correct on that, Greek scholars? Okay, we'll say it means to or into. <laughs> So, well, and I thought, what, a, what an amazing way to describe the Trinity. It's a dance into each other. So there's this motion, there is this desire, this whole choreography of oneness. And that's the way, that's the image in which we are made. So I don't think that within people's hearts there, there is ever, that can't be wiped out, that desire to enter <coughs> into that oneness that is in the Father and in Jesus with each other. So, I, uh, I say that long introduction simply to give you hope, you know, to say that we never give up on the hope because this is founded in who we are, and it is God's desire for us as it is God's desire within uh, the Trinity. So, um, thank you for, uh, it's a, such a pleasure to welcome you here because you are involved in that, and that you do give your time and your effort to bring about that uh, oneness that can only enhance not only the churches but our humanity so and of course it's the life i know you'll have welcomed monsignor Rodano much more expertly than than i can do today but Constantinople. therefore your holiness could we not envision the return of our churches to communion by agreeing together on a common ecclesiological vision corresponding to the consensus of the fathers Whereas the ecclesiological convictions belonging to the tradition of a local church would enjoy the status of theologumena without intending to impose them on the other churches as dogmas of the faith. David Smith from uh, the Saskatoon Diocese. I'm part of the Ecumenical Commission there. Spent some time listening to Monsignor Rodano today and heard an awful lot about uh, what the uh, church has been up to at a very high strategic level and engagement with other with other uh, denominations and it sounds like we're, we're ready a lot of the groundwork is done and there seems to be a spirit of optimism and openness second uh, presentation I, I entitled some further achievements of the modern ecumenical movement um, I suppose the word achievements, achievements, developments, maybe developments, we will say. Uh, after the um, lecture in the ecumenical, appeared in ecumenical trends, I want to point to five other things that, that either I did not mention there or maybe just alluded to and want to draw out a little more. So um, I would like to mention five developments which are also important uh, in the journey toward unity and have not gotten, in my opinion, have not gotten enough attention. The dialogues, uh, you know, from ecumenical movement, uh, ecumenical, the ecumenical movement, there are different structures. I mean, we have councils, World Council of Churches, Councils of Churches. Uh, we, there's a, the multilateral dialogue, the bilateral dialogue. Uh, various various structures which have assisted uh, us in um, in ecumenical in, in ecumenical factors. work. But I think it's important. Uh, the year 2017 will mark the 500th anniversary of the. It says we as Orthodox, Catholics, and Evangelical Christians have gathered to make the following declaration which we sign as individuals, not on behalf of our organizations, but speaking to and